and there were articles like that, particularly in the Evening Standard at that time. Um, the corpse in the car was the Evening Standard as well. And in a nutshell, what was the outcome of, of these libel proceedings? Uh, we did uh, settle. Um, they paid damages and uh, there was an apology published in the Evening Standard. Uh, the Daily Mail did not publish an apology. One point you, you, you make, um, these libel proceedings were brought with the benefit of conditional fee agreements, is that correct? Yeah, I think it's very important, um, given the scale of the task uh, that faced us, and we were given, we made our decisions after being fully informed of the pathway, and I think that's very important. It was a last resort. Um, and at the time, given our circumstances, um, I do not believe we would have had the resource to uh, go down that path if it wasn't for a CFA being in place. This is going to be your choice. It won't happen for anybody else, but it will be your choice. If you'd like a break for five minutes, we'll have it. If you'd prefer to carry on, we'll carry on. I'm happy to carry on. Yeah. Right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I ought to say I've confirmed it with yes. the shorthand right. There's a fair bit more, and I don't want to rush this. But sure. We'll, we'll, we'll see how we get on. Um, <clears throat> paragraph 82, first anniversary... You explain that you you agree to an interview with Hello magazine. Yeah. T just tell us a bit, please, about about why you did that. <clears throat> I think the first thing to say it was very specific, and um, we had clearly we've talked about our prime objective, which is finding Madeline, and uh, what we've hoped is that some good would come out of what happened to us. And one of the things, through our own research and uh, having been to the National Centre for Missing Exploited Children in the USA, was to talk about uh, Amber Alert. And we decided that we would start campaigning for a joined-up alert system for missing children within uh, Europe, particularly on the continent of Europe. And for that very specific reason, because Hello is distributed, I think, in 14 European countries, they did approach us and say, said that they would promote the campaign. And at the time, we were lobbying MEPs to sign a declaration supporting an alert system. So we agreed to do an interview on that basis, which, just for clarity, of course, we were not paid for. Many of the media outlets didn't really want to run with the work we were doing for the child rescue alert, which in itself is disappointing because it is important, but obviously it's not as exciting, but whatever the word is when it comes to headlines and stories. So actually we saw this as an opportunity of actually improving things for the greater good, really. So. Well, one, one rival, however, wasn't, wasn't best pleased, and you, you touched on this in paragraph um, 884. But... Maybe this is quite un understandable, um, but, but tell us a little bit about the call you received from the then editor of the News of the World. I think it would be fair to say that Mr Myler was irate when he learned of uh, the publication uh, which happened and uh, was berating us for not doing an interview with News of the World and uh, had told us how supportive the newspaper had been, including news and awards. And a time of um, stress for us uh, on the first anniversary, where we were actually launching uh, a new campaign. We were still our Guido at the time, a new call number for people to come forward so we could continue the search for our daughter. And we were interacting with the media to get that message out. And... Uh, he basically beat us into submission uh, verbally and we agreed to do an interview uh, the day after. I have to just emphasise, I mean, this is an, an extremely stressful time. It was a run-up to one year of not having our daughter with us. And emotionally, as well as logistically everything we were trying to do, it was incredibly hard. So to get a call like this, and you actually almost feel guilty 
you know, because they're saying, we've helped you, we've got a reward, and then you suddenly, you're almost saying, I'm, I'm sorry, and it's almost like, you know, somebody won't help you unless you give something back. Um, and of course, we were trying to make the distinction between interacting with the media for what we thought was something helpful for the search and simply doing an interview, which we knew would focus on the human interest aspects and not necessarily the search for Madeline. In the news of the world come I mean, to the um, narrative a few months later, because as, as you rightly say, now we're paragraph 86, and it may be that Dr. Kate McCann would like to deal with this, but I'm in your, your hands. Out, out of the blue, 14th of September 2008, transcripts from your personal diary appear, or purport to appear, in the news of the world. Can you tell us a bit about that, please? You're right, and this was totally out of the blue. It was um, Sunday lunchtime. We just got back from church, and I got a text message from um, a girl who works in the nursery where Madeline, Sean and Anne went, and it just said, um, saw your diary in the newspapers, heartbreaking, I hope you're all right. And it was totally out of the blue, and I had that horrible, panicky feeling, confusion, and, you know, what's she on about? I didn't have a clue. We rapidly found out it, it was in the news of the world. I went and looked at it online, which was five pages, including the front page. I got my original handwritten copy of my diary out and sat there, and it was lifted in its entirety and put in the newspaper without my knowledge. And apart from the odd word, which had, was, um, I think it was a translational error in that it had obviously been taken translated into Portuguese, and then the Portuguese copy had then been translated back to English, which was slightly different to the original, but pretty much verbatim. Um, and it's just been put there, and I felt totally violated. Um, you know, I'd, I'd written these words and thoughts at the most desperate time in my life, and most people won't have to experience that, and it was my only way of communicating with Madeline. And for me, you know, there was absolutely no respect shown for me as a grieving mother or as a human being, or for my daughter. And it made me feel very vulnerable and, and small. And, uh, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. And it, it didn't stop there. I mean, it's not just a one-day thing. I mean, that whole week was incredibly traumatic. And every time I thought about it, I just couldn't believe the injustice. And, you know, I actually just recently read through my diary entries at that point at that week and I talk about climbing into a hole and not coming out because I just felt so worthless that we've been treated like this. Can we just be clear as to the provenance of the, the diary? You mentioned a Portuguese translation which, which may be a clear indication of prov provenance but uh, perhaps I can take this quite, quite shortly, shortly that the, the judicial or police authorities in Portugal had obtained um, or had seized a copy of your diary, or perhaps it was the original, in August 2007, is that right? And yeah, it was We're talking about a hard copy manuscript document. So it was just, just handwritten. They, they'd come and said that they were taking um, clothes from the villa and we had to, had to leave. And when we got back later that day, I noticed that they'd also taken my diaries as well, which I have to say was a little bit of a shock, um, for other reasons, but anyway. And... Um, it did, they did come back to me about 24, 48 hours later. So right. I retained the original copy. Yes. Um, but so obviously photocopies were taken during that period. Yes, it's, it wasn't clear to your, from your statement, but it now is, that it was within quite a short space of time that the original was returned to you, um, you believe by order of a Portuguese judge. So it sounds as if the initial seizure, seizure had been a a step too far or whatever, but, yeah. but a, a copy of the original must have been taken by someone, presumably someone within the, the Portuguese police or judicial authorities, is that correct? We, I think it's clear that the uh, police had copied the journal and had it translated, um, and of course at the time we didn't understand why the journal could have been relevant, because Kate only started keeping it a couple of weeks after Madeline was taken. So. We didn't know there was a copy until the file was released the following summer. But within the file, the Portuguese judicial file, there is an order from the judge who's read the translation and says this is of no interest to the investigation. It's Kate's 
personal thoughts and should not, and he actually used the word violation. Use the word violation, violation. The use of which would be a violation of its author. And ordered that any copies be destroyed. And further investigation of that has revealed, if anything, um, to unpick where this came from. I would oh. like a further investigation as like to where it came from. Because clearly it was an illegal mm -hmm. copy. Yeah. I think what, what is relevant there, and I think this has already come out from Dr McKay, McCann's evidence, is that one or two things were lost in the translation or changed, which indicates that the piece in the News of the World was a translation yeah. from the Portuguese. Yes. Because had it been precisely verbatim, that might have led us Very to another... subtle changes, but things yes. like what I've put, I was really upset, it says I was fed up, you know, so it just yes. does change the meaning slightly. Maybe we can investigate that, or maybe that um, we'll receive an admission as to... Well, I'd like to know whether there's a, there's a byline. Is there a byline on the article? It says in, in her own words. Yes, yes, yes. I understand yeah. that. But yeah. is there a reporter's name associated with oh, it? Pardon me. Yes, there is. Well, there you are. There's a potential line of inquiry. It's a point I'd like to think can be dealt with very quickly by someone, it can be, it can be confirmed, because um, it's, it's pointless denying it, really. There's only one reasonable inference here. <coughs> Would you refer in paragraph 93 to a conversation which was reported to you from Clarence with the, the deputy editor of the News of the World, as he then was, Mr. Ian Edmondson. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? I think the first thing to say is that Clarence would speak to Ian Edmondson, who's deputy editor and uh, was probably responsible for most of the stories uh, relating to my Madeline at that time. So Clarence spoke to Ian on a regular basis and one or two of the other News of the World um, reporters. Um, Clarence had mentioned it to me, just saying that the News of the World had indicated that they would do a supportive story, uh, mainly attacking the Portuguese police, but generally supportive. That was it. There was no mention of having a copy of Kate's diary, no mention that they were intended publishing it for verbatim. Uh, so, as Kate has already said, it was a complete shock uh, when we heard that it was yes. printed. It's a, <clears throat> a breach of a number of tortious obligations. just going to touch upon the section continuing the relationship with the press. I, I'm not going to cover paragraph 97, but I, I, I will, unless I'm asked to specifically. If you wish me to, I will, but I wasn't minded to. I was going to ask you, though, about paragraph 100. I mean, I think, I think 97 is probably important. Okay, well, uh, tell, us, tell us about it in your own words. For one of the stories that was not published and it isn't libelous, not defamatory, mm -hmm. but uh, we were alerted to it um, and it was done by a freelance journalist who's written many inaccurate stories and um, had submitted it, I think it was to the people, if I'm right. Um, the people on Sunday, and uh, the editor or the sub editor, deputy editor, called Clarence just to say that they were running this. This was in the uh, evening of this, this Saturday, and Clarence phoned us, and it was complete nonsense. But it was basically saying that uh, we were undergoing IVF treatment uh, with a view to getting a new baby to replace Madeline, and. Um, I think the important thing, this demonstrates it's not just the articles that have been published that have been a problem. We've had many weekends destroyed because we've had to try and stop articles like this from actually ending up in the press. You know, and weekends are important for Jerry, that's already family time. 
had to involve lawyers on Friday nights and yes. um, and another another example there which I don't think is in uh, evidence um, but again a transparent Friday evening is uh, journalists um, had gone to speak to my mum uh, I think they said even that they you know Clarence said it was okay and my mum let them in and uh, a lady journalist took a copy of a unpublished photograph of Kate myself and Madeline when we lived in Amsterdam uh, that was very special to us and they were going to publish it in a Scottish newspaper on the Sunday and we had to involve Adam and uh, Isabel from Catarup to get that stopped mm. um, and I think the only way we managed it we got a very stroppy interaction with the editor was that uh, we owned the copyright of the picture and they were not in the least apologetic and I can't they were fighting it actually tell you they said, well we've got the picture <laughs> it's, like, it's our daughter <laughs> it's uh, the impact that these things have and what should be a little bit of respite uh, but there have been several occasions where we've gone behind the scenes at the 11th hour thank you and in paragraph 100 you deal with a piece in the Daily Mail quite recent July this year about a, an alleged reported sighting in India what are your feelings about that please it's probably one of the most recent examples of what I would say is the contempt uh, for Madeline and her safety. Um, there was no check. Um, this sighting had been reported to the police. Uh, I think we were actually on holiday. Um, they emailed us a photograph and we quickly indicated that it was not Madeline. And as far as we were concerned, it was dealt with. Uh, and then a day or two later, it gets published and uh, the newspaper on that occasion have chosen to publish it um, and they may want to justify why but from our point of view they don't know whether it's true they haven't contacted us and additionally we have the issue that if this really was a genuine sighting of Madeline then her captors may be alerted and move her so the story has precedence over the safety of our child and that is clear, and that has been done by, I think, every single newspaper, as well as similar instances of amateur sleuthing and the whole details about investigation that should only be known to the witnesses and the potential to contaminate evidence by having read something that you shouldn't really know about. And all of the newspapers and broadcasters have been guilty of it. A little bit out of, of sequence because I'm going to come back to the PCC because it's a more general point, I think. Um, under the heading Kate's book, we're now in paragraph 111. Is it maybe that um, in your hands as to which of you would like to, to deal with this, this piece of evidence? Maybe. Sure. Book published in May of 2011, so we're, we're at the fourth anniversary, presumably it was to, to mark that, or we'll coincide with that. Um, obviously a difficult decision. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I mean, Just you're right, it, it was a very difficult decision for obvious reasons, for all the reasons we've been discussing. Um, but ultimately, you know, we are responsible for conducting and funding the search to find our daughter. Yes. And ultimately, you know, I had to make the decision. We needed to raise money. I knew this was something that I could do um, that could maintain the search and possibly help us find our daughter. And that's why I took the decision um, to do it. Obviously, in the ideal world, you wouldn't choose to do anything like that. And there was serialisation of your book in two news international titles, The Sun and The, the Sunday Times. Yeah. You talk about a meeting with, with Rebecca Brooks, which led to a review of your, your, your case, uh, a formal review. Just to assist us a little bit with that, can you, can you recall when that was? 
I think it's probably worth just elaborating a little bit because uh, it's quite a complex decision making process in terms of agreeing to serialise the book. Um, News International actually bid for the rights of the book along with HarperCollins and one of their uh, pitches was the fact that they would seri serialise the book across all of their titles and we were somewhat horrified at the prospect of that given the way we had been treated in the past and the deal was actually done with the publishers, Transworld, that uh, excluded um, serialisation. Now, we were subsequently approached by News International and Associated to serialise the book. And after much deliberation, we had a, a couple of meetings with the general manager and uh, Will Lewis and Rebecca Brooks and others and what swung the decision to serialise was News International uh, committed to backing the campaign and the search for Madeline. And that passed our test of how it could help. And we had been lobbying behind the scenes uh, for two and a half years with success of Home Secretaries to try and get a review of Madeline's case. And we felt that having News International helping um, in that, and ultimately where I think the media have helped in this situation of galvanising the public, having them re-engaged with us and, this, and Madeline is what tipped the balance. But her intervention was successful? It was. May may not be a module... Yes. I was right to say in terms of the sequence of, of events, I think the Prime Minister was involved just a bit before and then the Home Office the day after. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we had written to the Home Secretary uh, saying that we'd be launching the book and asking her to update us on where they had got... Um, <coughs> And we got one letter, um, which really didn't say very much. And then we did the open letter to the Prime Minister in the front, which was published on the front page of the Sun. <coughs> yes. we'll turn back to the, the issue of the, the involvement of the PCC. This, this is covered both in your, your witness statement and in evidence you <coughs> gave. Joe McCann to the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee in 2009 and then it was picked up in the second report I think of that committee. There's a whole section of the report <coughs> goes to that, that issue. The, the position I think is, so I, I'm, I'm back in your statement um, uh, paragraph 101. Is that the, the PCC's position is that at an early stage they put a message out that they were ready, willing and able to assist you. This was in May 2007, mm -hmm. do you follow me? Yeah. I think your, your evidence is, well, you never got that message, is that right? Uh, if I did, uh, I, it was lost in the time when we were obviously dealing with lots of things and I would say probably similar to Mrs Gascoigne who gave evidence earlier this morning that uh, I was only vaguely aware of the PCC at that time. Paragraph 103, you say, that we have on a number of occasions had cause to contact the PCC. The PCC was extremely helpful in dealing with the unwanted intrusion into the privacy of our twins. Now, are you referring there to the... Um, the business with the paparazzi taking sure. photographs when you're back in the United Kingdom. Yeah. I think, though, we had also indicated earlier in the summer of 2007 that although we tacitly agreed to having photographs of us taken in prior deluge, largely because we felt that we couldn't stop it, particularly with international be media being there, that as the situation dragged on over months we didn't want continued photographs of Sean and Amelie to be published 
and we were obviously concerned at the time there were just two, but as they got older they could be recognised. So there was an agreement, um, and I can't remember exactly if the PCC were involved in that, but we asked the media not to publish photographs of Sean and Amelie, and that was adhered to with pixelation up until we arrived back in the UK, and then it went out the window again. In terms of the PCC assisting you in relation to the wider issue of inaccurate, unfair and sensationalist reporting, it may well be that there isn't a factual dispute between you and the PCC, at that time of course speaking through Sir Christopher Mayer, because if, if, if you kindly look under tab 9, Dr McCann, yeah. We'll see relevant extracts from the report of the Culture, Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. It was published on the 9th of February 2010. And you, I invite your attention. The pagination is working on the top right-hand side of each page to page 87. You, you should find a heading, the role of the PCC, I hope, and then paragraph 354. There, there we deal with the message which um, they say they gave to you and you've told us um, really well you don't recollect it and of course a lot was going on. But there, there was a meeting, and this is 355, on the 13th of July 2007, which was not just accidental. Yes. And the, the, general, the general thrust of what you were told by Sir Christopher Mayer during the course of an informal conversation, is, is, is this correct? That if you wanted to, to deal with the issue of libel, well, then the route was legal recourse, legal action. Um, but if you wanted to deal with it in some other way, well, then the PCC might be able to help. Yeah. Does that capture it's, the it's sense of what, what sure. that mean? It, it's probably fair to put in there that uh, I had a number of conversations with Sir Christopher, uh, primarily because we became friendly with his wife, Lady Catherine, uh, through her work with Pact. So I, on that first occasion, I, I met Sir Christopher and he just broadly asked, uh, how are the media treating you? And was very open in at that point said, well, considering the interest, not too bad. And we didn't really have too much in the way of specific complaints. I did have further informal conversations and they also dealt with correspondence from Kingsley and Apley over the period. But the gist of the conversations and most of my dialogue with them was informal rather than written was that we agreed with our legal advice, and we took the best legal advice we could get, that the way to stop this was to take legal action and not to go to the PCC. And I think Sir Christopher agreed with that. That's a fair, fair summary, Dr McGann. It's what, it's what the, the, the committee think as well, although Paul, Paul Dacre expressed disappointment that you, you didn't make a formal complaint to the PCC. Uh, although Sir, Sir Christopher disagreed with Paul Dacre, so we have two viewpoints here as to what might have yeah, been the best Yeah, I mean, I think forward. the ultimate thing was we, we discussed course of action and our advice, which was given in no uncertain terms, this is legal advice, was that the PCC were not fit to deal with the accusations, uh, the nature of them, uh, the number of them and the severity. Now, the inquiry will note, and it's, but it's not necessary for, for me to read it out, the conclusions of the select committee on these, these issues. They start at page 360, uh, pardon me, paragraph 364 and 365 in bold. And a direct criticism is made by the Select Committee of the PCC that here with the press beginning to ignore the requirements of the code and the PCC remains silent. And then under the heading Lessons Learned, they review your case 
he rightly points out uh, that this was a very unusual case. They state that the coverage was, was freakish, and then their conclusions are set out at paragraphs 373 and 375. Perhaps I should read those out. Well, the word freakish is, is the committee saying it's far from clear that the McCann coverage was really so freakish. Paragraph 373. The newspaper industry's assertion that the McCann case is a one-off event shows that it's, it is in denial about the scale and gravity of what went wrong and about the need to learn from those mistakes. In any other industry suffering such a collective breakdown, as for example in the banking sector now, any regulator worth its sort would have instigated an inquiry. Press indeed would have been clamouring for it to do so. It's an indictment on the PCC's record that it signally failed to do so. The industry's words and actions suggest a desire to bury the affair without confronting its serious implications a kind of avoidance which newspapers would criticise mercilessly and rightly if it occurred in any other part of society. The PCC, by failing to take firm action, let slip an opportunity to prevent or at least mitigate some of the most damaging aspects of this episode, and in so doing lent credence to the view that it lacks teeth and is slow to challenge the newspaper industry. Is there anything you wish to add or subtract from, from that? I think I would agree with it, and it's probably others are best placed to decide whether the PCC could have actually changed it, though. I think that's a moot point. I deal now with some general points, including the, the four general You, you, you refer to the uh, B or A culture change which is required. May I invite you please to put that in your own words, both to identify the existing culture and then the change which you think is required? Well, I think we can uh, speak with experience about uh, how powerful the media are and uh, how much damage they can do. And we've already said how many good things that they have done as well. So there is power, there is no doubt about it. But what we see on a daily basis are front page tabloid headlines in particular, sometimes followed by clamour with 24-hour news channels and internet and a blurring of the media, of stories which appear to have no factual basis or exaggerated or are distorted. And you've heard about several of hundreds that were written about us, but we see them. I walk into the shop in the hospital every day and I see front page headlines, whether it's about Chris Jeffries, who's going to give evidence, or contestants on the X Factor. And I think information is being written and lives are being harmed by these stories. And something has to change. A commercial imperative is not acceptable. Thank you. Now, the, the four specific headings which um, you've given us, I mean, in one, one sense, it, you've largely covered these, but I think it's, it's helpful if we can bring the strands together. The, the first is libel. Might it be said, and can I just invite you to deal with this, well, this, in fact, is an example, your case, of the system working to the extent that you decide at a certain point that enough is enough. Um, obviously, as professional people, you're not going to put your house on the line to fund legal action, but conditional fee arrangements were available. You took advantage of that. Within a, a reasonably swift time frame, there's others to decide whether it was quick enough or, or whatever, the position of express newspapers changes, they admit liability, they make a statement in open court, they pay £550,000, which uh, in the scale of things is a significant amount of money with modern libel awards, and there's a front page apology. 
Is that an example of the system working, or do you have a different take on what I've just said? I think it is an example of the system working in part. However, we would much rather we weren't awarded any damages and the stories had not been published. And I think it's very important to emphasise that we have experienced long-lasting damage as a result of the headlines and uh, media coverage, including recent trips to Holland and Spain where a taxi driver said, oh, you're the parents who were accused of killing your own daughter. What happened? And secondly, in Spain, where they showed a film that supposedly had us, you know, showing tablets that were tranquilizers that we'd supposedly given to our children, stated as virtually fact. So we're still having to do this, and although we've worked incredibly hard to change things in the UK, the damage is more widespread. So the money is only, for me... And I understand that the costs may be more of a deterrent than the damages per se, but it's only a partial compensation. And once it's there, yes, the apology goes part of the way, but as we've seen, often the reporting is much wider than the original offending um, outlet. And the damage is long-lasting. Yes. And if you go on the internet now, which are... Seven, well, six, nearly seven-year-old twins will be doing. Most of these allegations are still there, mm -hmm. and we will have to continue dealing with them going forward. You make two points there. I think, Dr. McCann. The first is the the point one: damages are never proper recompense, and that is right. The the judges recognise that, whether it's a reputation case or personal injuries case, the money can 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 never provide reparation. But then the particular point in your case is that there's an international dimension and whatever happens in the United Kingdom in terms of statements in open court, they're not going to carry any, any mileage or impact outside this jurisdiction, hence your yeah. experiences in Spain and the Netherlands. Correct. So that, that, that's a help, helpful observation. Uh, what, what about your second heading, which was privacy Laws. Could, could you help us a bit more with, with that, please? Yeah, I think it's something, obviously, we probably hadn't thought too much about before we found ourselves in the situation that we are. Um, you take your anonymity for granted. Um, what I find um, disturbing, clearly, are when you're being followed, um, you're being put in danger by either reporters or uh, photographers' behaviour, and you all to yours. And secondly, I think it is probably an anomaly within the legal system that a commercial organisation can take a photograph of you, use it in their product, which they sell, and make a profit without your consent. I, and I think that should be remedied. I think if I'm here, I know I'm in public... I'm giving evidence. I understand that the images will be used. I fully understand that, and I'm implicitly consenting to it. Mm. But whether it's us going for a run or driving out of our front drive, and particularly with children, I don't think it should be allowed. I think that you should not be allowed to publish photographs of private individuals going about their private business without their explicit consent signed. The, the existing... PCC Editor's Code speaks of either a private place or a public place where there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. Your, your evidence is suggesting that that latter concept is, is quite a difficult one to understand and in particular to apply. Mm -hmm. And so that maybe further thought need be, need be given to that. The, the third issue you may or may not have brought out adequately but but please expand if, if you'd wish to. Contempt, contempt for the judicial process, <coughs> namely the secrecy implications of really Portuguese law, I think, and, and for your child's safety. Yeah. Um, you, have to, you have addressed that issue, but is there anything you'd like to expand upon it, bring any strands together? Yeah, it's not. I wouldn't be explicit to uh, judicial secrecy in Portugal, and by judicial I meant the whole process, which in Portugal is obviously overseen by a judge. 
Um, so you have information. Uh, we were told, you know, we were under judicial secrecy not to give details of events. Uh, what became very apparent was, you know, the media were trying to create a timeline of what <laughs> happened. And we had obviously created a timeline and given it to the police and tried to narrow down to the closest minutes when we think Madeline was taken to help the investigation. But when that information goes into the public domain and the abductor shouldn't know it, or the only person who should know it were the people who were there, then that's a concern. It can contaminate evidence. Um, you could incriminate yourself by knowing something that you shouldn't have known. Uh, so that is the first process. And I think clearly, and again, as I'm not a lawyer, I may be speaking out of turn, but it's probably clear when there is a court case on in the United Kingdom uh, about what's to be reported and what not, and the police are very careful about which information they give to the media in this country. But for me, there was contempt about that whole investigative process. There was no regard for the outcome. It was much more important for the media outlets to have the detail or perhaps to have the contradictions and the salacious aspects that followed it. So, and then uh, the point about Madeline has never been raised, I think, before. Um, and clearly, every outlet, I think, has been guilty of this, uh, about reporting, citing suspicious people without giving it to the proper authorities. And that is of grave concern. And it's obviously our concern and focus is Madeline, but it applies to other cases as well. Poor heading is, is, is quite a broad one. Acceptable standards. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at the National, I did have a quick look at the National Union of Journalists submission, and there are standards, but there are no penalties for not sticking to them. And uh, whatever your profession is, uh, particularly in this country, then there is fairly strong regulation which we have to abide to. And I have seen no individual journalist or editor brought to account over the stories, be it within Express Newspapers group or Associated or any of the other groups. And I think that if there are repeated offenders, then they should lose the privilege of practising as a journalist. Quite difficult, that. Be, uh, I, I'm understand exactly why you're saying it, but just let me share with you the difficulty. That what journalists do is exercise the right of free speech. And whereas you as doctors require licence to practise medicine, and if you uh, uh, are taken to the GMC, then the GMC have all sorts of sanctions available, it's quite difficult in relation to the exercise of free speech. That's not to say that there shouldn't be penalties, that there shouldn't be some mechanism whereby there's a holding to account for what you've done. Sure. But Thank you, sir. I, I would like to emphasise that I strongly believe in freedom of speech. But where you have people who are repeatedly carrying out inaccuracies and have been shown to do so, then there should be, they should be held to account. That is the issue. I don't have a problem somebody purporting a theory, writing, fiction, suggestions, uh, but clearly we've got to a stage where substandard reporting and sources, unnamed, made up, non-verifiable, are a daily occurrence. Yes. I wasn't criticising you at all, but I was simply seeking to explain why that particular remedy may be very difficult to apply in this context. But it's not to say there shouldn't be something. Now, I'm not saying what, because that's part of what I'm here for. If anything, I say immediately. Um, but uh, you've doubtless read that different people have been suggesting different models, sure. and it's actually that uh, question which is the burning part of the job that I've got to do, which only underlines how extremely valuable yeah. your experience has been, and uh, how very grateful I am for you sharing it with us. Sure. I've got 
got no more questions, Dr. McCann, Dr. McCann, but is um, there anything you want to add? Mr. Sherborne has a, has a point, but that um, concludes all I have to ask. No, I think we've covered all the points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sherborne, did you want to ask something? Sir, I realise that um, we all need time properly to digest the very uncomfortable evidence that the McCanns have given. As I mentioned last week, uh, we say it's nothing short of a national scandal. But there's one point I do formally want to raise. Uh, it was touched on earlier. Uh, we've seen representatives of the media organisations stand up very quickly to respond to the criticisms made of their newspapers. Is, is, is there going to be a question here, Mr. There is, sir. Well, then I'd like to know what the question It's not a is. question. I raise this. It was mentioned by the McCanns, and, and you mentioned it as well, and that is in relation to News International. And what we do ask is they provide a response, sir, as you mentioned, in relation to the publication of Kate McCann's diary. Right. Mr. Sherburn, I think that is a speech. Um, we, can, we can discuss what we should do, and, of course, I'm in a position to do something about it, because if there's a name then I can issue a request, and I put the word request in inverted commas, under Section 21 of the 2005 Act, and I can find out. Well, sir, I understand that. It's not just the byline, if I may say, with respect, because that's the person who wrote the story. There is also the question which I'm sure the McCanns would like to be dealt with if possible, which is who obtained, and in what circumstances they obtained, the diary from the police. I understand. Police. But that's 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 a, a decision at a higher level. That's a thread, and I'm I, I'm absolutely al alert to the point. I'm I really grateful. am. I'm very grateful. Thank you, uh, Dr. McCann. Dr. McCann, thank you very much indeed. Um, I can only wish you all good, everything well in your continuing search for Madeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's something I'm not sure I can ingest immediately. It's probably something that um, can be dealt with as between two of the core participants in the first instance rather than troubling you. And if it can't, well, we'll come back to it to, tomorrow morning. But um, All right. Is there anything else that uh, I can deal with now? Mm -hmm.